business of the city. God will bless you anyways. Why? Because he is that kind of loving God. Hallelujah. He's not looking. He's not looking for individuals that have already made it. He's looking for people who are looking to be perfected. Are you with me? Hallelujah. The book of Ephesians says, I'm coming to take a church that is spotless with no wrinkles. How do we become spotless and wrinkleless? The Bible says, you are not saved by your works. Hallelujah. We are saved by our faith in Him who has died for each and every one of us. It is not how much you, you try to be sanctified that actually makes you holy before God. Are you with me? Do you know that what you hear can make you unpure before God? Uh, let, let me say it again. Not what you did. Not what you, you sinned in. What, what you heard can make you unpure before God. God is so holy. His presence is so holy that nothing that we carry is worth even approaching His holy throne. It is by grace that we've entered through the blood of the Lamb to be justified by Him, not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our abilities, but because of the grace of God bestowed on each and every one of us. So God is not looking uh, for the city where He's necessarily well received. He's looking simply for somebody who's willing to receive Him. Hallelujah. And so He stops. It's time. This woman comes up. He's at the well. And the Bible says that Jesus is dying. And he says to this particular woman at the well, give me a drink. It, it's, it's weird because when I read the scripture, I, I see there is tension. There is tension in the scripture. Uh, from, from the very beginning, we, we read how he's going from one city to another, but he has to stop in the middle. Uh, we, we're reading how he, he, has, uh, uh, he has baptized many people, but he, it, the Bible says that it's not actually him baptizing, because they hated him for the many people he baptized. But then the Bible puts in parentheses that it was not even Jesus baptizing, it was his disciples baptizing. Are you with me? Amen. Somebody said there is tension in the scriptures. Somebody said there is tension in the scriptures. Mm. So Jesus Christ is supposed to be the son of God. He's supposed to be God himself. But then physically the Bible says he's tired. There is, there is tension. It does not make sense. How can you be God but be tired? Because I know that my God never sleeps nor slumber. There, there is tension in the scriptures. And, then, and, and he gets to this particular point where he's walked so much that he's grown tired. Not only is he tired but he is thirsty. And now he's asking for somebody who is not necessarily the ideal person to give him something to drink. There, there is tension in the scriptures. There, there is contriving ideas and things that may not necessarily uh, make sense to the humanistic eye. He is God and he is the Messiah, uh, yet he is, he is evoked to, to be shown in a manner where his human side is tired. And so, what begins to happen is that we can begin to be so focused with what is happening around us on the surface that we actually begin to miss everything that God is trying to say or to do. Because when Jesus Christ is asking for the drink from the woman, Jesus Christ is not necessarily depending on this particular woman to provide to him to his need. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to let you know exactly what the scriptures are meaning because we, we can begin to be so spiritual sometimes that we lack the depth of the revelation of God. Hallelujah. Listen, just because you're spiritual doesn't mean that you're revelatory. There's a lot of people that want to be spiritual but lack revelation. There's a lot of people that walk as though they know things but don't have revelation. There's a lot of people that want to be different for God, 
and want to be peculiar, as the Bible says, for God, but lack revelation. If you're peculiar with no revelation, if you're different but lack revelation, you might as well be walking dead. Hallelujah. There is a lot of spiritual individuals, and this was the very case with the Jews, with the Pharisees. They were very spiritual. They knew how to do all the ceremonies. They knew how to do all these particular things, but they missed many times the revelation behind what it was that they were doing. To the point where we begin to look at things on the surface and we miss exactly what is going on down under. Jesus Christ says to this particular woman, give me something to drink. The woman looks at him and she says to him, how, how can a Samaritan woman even have anything to do with the Jew? Now, understand this. The Jews and the Samaritans did not have a good relationship because of the way that they understood things. The Jews always saw themselves greater than the Samaritans. The Samaritans saw themselves as very, very uh, uh, ingrained in the Mosaic law. So they thought they were better than them. So when the woman says to Jesus, uh, what is there between the Samaritan woman and the Jewish man, there was actually a double foul. Because not only were the Jews and the Samaritan not to be in, in contact with each other, but men, a male uh, Jew, Talking to a female Samaritan was a double foul. Now, Jesus looks at her and he says, Woman, you don't understand what I just asked you. He says, If you knew, if you understood what I asked you, then you would have understood that the one that you're talking to can give you water that will quench your thirst forever? The woman, uh, just, just bear with me. The woman looks at him and says, man of God, how can you give me water if you don't even have a vessel to draw the water from? Now, now, now. Just that particular sentence allows for us to see that in actuality, Jesus Christ was not asking for water. Jesus Christ was asking for the vessel to get water. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ does not need your content. Jesus needs your vessel. Are you with me? God is not interested with what we have to bring from the inside of us. He only needs us to come to him as we are so that he can fill us. The only thing, see, see, what we confuse a lot of times when we say that, you know what, God cannot do anything without human beings. It is true to a certain extent. God can only use you as a vessel to bless his people. He does not need what you bring to the table. What he needs is you as a temple in order for you to be used by him. So we can get so caught up with what it is that we're showing and we're seeing on the surface that we actually miss the point whenever God is coming to us, whenever God is approaching us, whenever God is requesting us. What Jesus was in need from the woman that was her vessel to draw the water. See, the woman is so caught up with the fact that this man is from Samaria, uh, is uh, uh, Jewish, and he's coming and talking to her, that she's interested only in giving him something that is physical. But God is saying that I don't need any physical thing. What I'm looking for is the thing that is on the inside of you that I can use and feel for my good. Are you with me? And so, he says uh, to her, woman, if only who, uh, whoever drinks of this particular water, water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up from everlasting to everlasting. Now, she was speaking in terms of the well. What the woman was seeing 
was a will. The will is always temporary. See, the woman, the Samaritan woman, is so religious and so caught up in her, her, her religion and her background that she fails to see that what God is looking for from her is not the physical thing, but it is something more spiritual. She's speaking in terms of will, but listen how Jesus is entering. Jesus is entering in terms of fountain. Are you with me? She says that... Uh, how can you draw the water from the well if you don't have anything to draw with? Jesus answers, no, 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 no. The water that I'm about to bring you will be a fountain that is everlasting. The woman is speaking physically. Jesus is speaking spiritually. She's speaking about a well. He's speaking about a fountain. What you don't realize, woman, is that you're speaking to the very source itself. You're looking at physical water, you're looking at temporary water, but what I, I, I can bring you is something that is everlasting. See, what we begin to confuse with God most of the time as human beings is that when we come to him, we think that what it is that he's giving us are these temporary things that we're able to see that will pass tomorrow. God is interested in something that is much deeper than that with you. God is not looking at what it is that you have as skills and what you're bringing to the table. God is interested in something that is much deeper that has been planted in you. The spiritual gift of God is more effective than the physical gift that he's given you. Are you with me? Is this too deep? The spiritual gift of God is much more powerful than the physical gift that you have. You can come and sing all you want and have all the skills that you can bring to the table and begin to tell him, listen, God, I have this degree in this, and I have this degree in that, and I have a skill in this, and I have a skill in that. Before God, let's look. He says, I have things that are more everlasting than what you can bring. The exchange that God is looking for is not what you can give him, but what you're able to receive from him. See, God is just looking for an empty vessel. God is simply looking for an individual that can make himself available. The, the, the woman still doesn't understand. See, she's so ingrained in, in, her, in her ideology, in her theology, in her understanding, in her religious ways, that she fails to understand the language of Jesus. Do you know that you can be so caught up in what you've learned that you fail to see what God is telling you now? Hallelujah. You can get so caught up in what you heard yesterday. Do, do you know that God can tell you something yesterday and then today he refreshes it with a new revelation? But yet you're still caught up in yesterday's revelation and you miss what he's doing today. Yesterday was only the foundation. What he wants you to do with what you received yesterday is build on that. I give you this revelation and I give you this particular word, but I didn't give it to you for you to dwell on it. This is what he said to the people of Israel. You've dwelt long enough around this particular mountain. Yes, I give you manna in the midst of the desert, but just because I fed you manna doesn't mean that you're supposed to dwell in the desert. Are you with me? That God, there is an ultimate place that I'm trying to get to. There is an ultimate thing that I need to do. So here's what God will do most of the time when we don't understand his language. So Jesus responds to her, oh, okay, I, I see that you still don't understand my language. Why? Because the woman responds in this particular way in verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw any water. She still thinks that when he's speaking, that he's speaking in a physical way. So she says, give me the water so I don't have to come back to Jacob's well anymore. I honor Jacob and, and, and he's the father of all the people of Israel and I don't want to come back to this well so give me the physical water. Jesus perceives that this woman has just missed the point. Listen how he answers to her. He says, woman, go call your husband. And come here. Hallelujah. Amen. God, when we fail to notice him, when we fail to understand his word, 
will bring us back to our area of our proclivities in order to draw us back to you. God will expose your weakness in order for you to begin to realize that he's there. See, see, God will speak to you in one way. If you don't hear him, you don't listen, you don't pay attention, you don't catch it, he will give you another revelation. And if you still don't catch it, here is the way that oftentimes God will relate to you. He will bring you back to your mistake. To let you know that I know you and where it is that you come from. Because you keep on trying to explain to me how it is that I need to work with you. But I'm here to tell you that it's not about you. There is a deeper well than the one that you're seeing here. There is a deeper you than what you've already experienced in your life. There is a greater you on the inside. So let me tell you, I know you, but I don't just know you in your areas of blessings, but I know you in your areas of weakness. Because if I can show you your weakness, there is no way that you can run from this. Because he knew that this woman had some secrets. See, see God won't expose things that everybody knows. God won't tell you about things that everybody talks about. God will always deep on the inside of you and begin to search up things that you ain't never told nobody. Have you ever been in a predicament where you go in front of a prophet or in front of a man of God where they begin to tell you areas of your life that you never thought that anybody knew about? God is not exposing you. God is pushing you towards him. He's saying that what I want you to focus on is me, not you. I want you to focus on me. And if I can go back to your areas of secrets and things that you've hidden on the inside of you and begin to talk about you and begin to dissect your life in areas that you never thought anybody could ever dissect your life about. When I begin to tell you how you fell here, when I begin to tell you how you stumbled here, when I begin to tell you, woman, I know that you had five husbands. I'm asking you not because I didn't know, but I'm asking you so that you can...